Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I start, I just want to welcome my new Patreon members, Joseph. Ooh, your last name is hard to pronounce. Texaria? I'm so sorry if I Teixeira? butchered that. I didn't mean... I don't know. Teixeira? Is that is that right? Yeah, I think that... Oh, uh, that... Uh, no. 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 That's okay. Before yeah, I no. introduce my mystery guest Before who I, yeah. you can now hear because I'm <laughs> trying to get him to help me pronounce <laughs> names. Before I introduce... Ignore him. There's nobody there. I want to talk about Joseph Texiera. I'm so sorry. Joseph. Joe. Good old Joe. Our friend Joe. <laughs> and Robert S. For joining my Patreon. Thank you guys so much for supporting this podcast. It means the world to me. I really, really appreciate it. And of course, if you want to support my podcast, go to patreon.com slash Unfiltered to get access to episodes like this streamed live and also be able to submit questions um, and all kinds of other bonus goodies. All right. So my guest today was awarded the Adult Empire Male Performer of the Year for good reason. He's one of the most solid performers in the business right now with a really insightful perspective on the industry and relationships. And he's a performer and a producer for LA's Kinky Rabbit Parties, which we will definitely get into. Welcome, Cody Steele. Hello. Yay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Round. mystery man. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I interviewed you once very briefly at ABN at the oh, Adult yeah. Time booth. Uh, we talked well, about the story time, yeah. that we will get into later, mm -hmm. but we've worked together a bunch. You were in Hopeless, which thank you so much for, for being a part of that movie. Well, it was a pleasure to do that one. Yeah. And you're a part of uh, the new one too, that we're not allowed to talk about mm -hmm. yet, but that is, that is coming. <laughs> um, and you're also um, one of the most solid performers in the industry. Like I said, one of the hardest working guys. Uh, you're you. also Vanna Bardo's boyfriend. That's true. That's how I'm most known. <laughs> <laughs> no, I Not mean, yeah, true. Yeah. Not I mean, true. I uh, knew you before you were that. To, yeah. When it comes to awards and things like that, or those types of people. Yeah. Do you feel like, carpet. do you feel like that, that you get. Oh, for sure. That a lot. I mean, you know, it makes sense, you know, with the industry, the women are touted the most, mm -hmm. you know, and I think within the industry, I definitely have that. But a lot of times when it comes to, um, red carpets and things like that. Like the amount that she's done, the work that she's put forward and things like that, a lot of times they it's very overshadowing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the fact that she won Performer of the Year two years in a so row? So X was two years in a row. AVN was last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just swept the awards. Yeah. Yeah. Last I think year, actually times. when we were out with um, Vixen after that, I think that was their most awarded year was last year. Wow. They pulled home the most awards within the company, the the group entirely. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. How much of that went to Vanna's stuff? I think with her, I think she took home six AVN awards. Yeah. And I think with the movie in its entirety, I think it was somewhere up near nine. Wow. Yeah. How did you guys get all those awards home? Did you bring a wheelbarrow? That, that was the thing. Did Honestly, you have an award we, butler? We've been, we've been asking to, and if you if you are out there, there were a couple of people who got shots of us after we were leaving the AVN area. Um, and I am just carrying boxes of awards because they just gave them to you. They gave them to you? They're, and and they're it's heavy. Like, yeah, well, that's the thing, too. And now we flew. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, we need to go buy an extra suitcase. Luckily, we found ways. We just took them all of the boxes and just took the awards themselves and found enough ways to pack them in the suitcase and disperse them across the suitcases. Luckily, I pack light, so we were able to get them all back. But yeah, there was a couple people who got pictures of me literally carrying all of them and her just up front with her big two that she had, you know, yeah. for her showcase and then for her as Female Performer of the Year. Um, but yeah, a couple of people got those pictures. We've never seen those pictures. So if you have one of those pictures out there, please tweet it or send it to us or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can send it to me. I will I will forward it we go. on because yeah. I, like I would like to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I got a, I mean, I got one, one, and that was heavy. I was mm. surprised yeah. at how much weight that Yeah, held. yeah, they're, it's a real thing. Like, yeah. you would almost think that they might be just kind of skimping on it, but that's, they're heavy. I think they, I think actually when I weighed them out too, they weigh like 8.6 pounds a piece. Yeah. Because we had for the airplane, you know. Right. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we have to know what we're doing here, so, yeah. <laughs> that's a good problem yeah. to have. No, for sure, yeah. So. The cabinet at home is full. <laughs> Let's start off um, with your 
background. You said mm-hmm. you grew up Mormon, is that right? That's correct. So yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Were your parents super religious? I know that there's been different varying. Yeah, yeah. They weren't anything like the, there's fundamentalist Mormons, which are the okay. ones that everybody, all the stereotypes that you would think about it are kind of true with them. They have multiple wives. They live kind of in the middle of nowhere. They marry women off very young. Um, your standard Mormon person is literally just a Christian, essentially. Just, you know, they don't, they, you know, a lot of them still drink caffeine and things like that, which is something, you know, that they always get things for where it's like Mormons don't drink this or don't, you know, they don't drink alcohol. I know a lot of Christians do and Catholics especially, but, you know, they don't drink alcohol. That's one thing that's throughout the most of it. But, um, but Are yeah, you they're like just not standard. allowed to drink alcohol? Like if you're Mormon they're, and you drink, do they kick it, you out of the church? No, it comes from a thing where um, in, I think, it's in the Bible. They said that you're not really supposed to enjoy strong drink or a mind altering drink. So when Joseph Smith uh, wrote the um, Book of Mormon or translated it, whatever, um, it was something that he like, there's a story about where he had to have like a, a something taken out of his leg or he broke his leg or something. They had to do a medical procedure on him. And the thing back then was just to drink whiskey until you were so drunk, you couldn't feel it and they would do it. And he like turned down the whiskey because it was against his religion to drink it because no mind altering substances and like did this all like, you know, raw and just let them, you know. So that's like the touted story with it, where it's like, we don't drink because, you know, our founder said that we don't do any mind altering substances, but caffeine is a mind altering substance. Sugar is a mind altering substance. We ignore those ones, but alcohol is the one thing that they're like, you know, we don't go out and drink at all. There's no drinking in the religion as part of it. Like Catholics will do like wine. They don't do anything like that. It's just water, bread, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Yeah. Mormons are, it's just a standard. My parents were standard. Just, you know, go to church every Sunday you know, worship, pray, all that good stuff. But yeah. How are you with religion now? (laughs) Um, my real thoughts on it, I'm, I'm, I'm actually against it. Um, I believe that you don't need, um, a religion or an ideology to tell you to be a good person. Mm -hmm. I think that what it does is it creates this, uh, narcissist type of personality disorder where people believe that they have an upper hand on other people just because they're touting some sort of ideology that they believe in. And it leads to a lot of division, But, um, you know, everyone can do whatever they like. I don't participate in any sort of religious ceremonies or anything like that. Um, And as far as my family goes, I mean, you know, they can pray or whatever. I just be quiet during it and don't, you know, really interrupt it. So Mm -hmm. they can do whatever they like. Everyone can do whatever you want to do. Just don't try and infringe and make me do what you want just because you believe in it. Right. Yeah. What I find funny about... Mormonism or the way that people view it. So this is coming from somebody who grew up in an atheist household. My dad was like a very staunch atheist. So like Anna did as well. Literally like never went to church. Like my dad thought people who believed in Jesus were stupid. Like that kind of, like he was a very like intellectual. Um, Mormonism, I have seen like made fun of a lot, like especially like the Book of Mormon, which is one of my favorite fucking musicals. It's so good. Oh, it was amazing. It's so good. Especially when you're raised Mormon too. There's so many jokes. Like there's an exterior where they did it, where it's like, this is funny to everyone. And then there's underlying things that are just hilarious yeah. that they get a, where it's like if you were a normal person going to see you never raised in that you have no idea the depths at which they understand that religion and all the hypocrisies within it it's yeah it's yeah. crazy the funny thing i think about that and i think about how people make fun of mormons and then you know and they they talk about what a ridiculous idea it is that john smith like he found extra writings on gold you know, plates gold on the plates, ground yeah. or something like that but and then like, but then i also yeah. i'm like have you read the bible yeah. That's also ridiculous. Yeah. But because it's old and it's been around for a long time, that's right. fine. It's but you Jesus. also believe that like Eve came from a rib yeah. and then she ate an apple and then like that right. ruined mankind. Yeah. I'm like, that. that's also yeah. silly. It's all silly. Yeah, that's, and that's what I was, you know, <laughs> when I was in school, honestly, I was one of the biggest defenders of Mormons, even uh-huh. though I was uh, absolutely against all of it. It bugged me the fact that they're going to get like messed with just because they believe in something that literally has as much value and founding as anyone else's. If you're a Christian, if you're Catholic, they literally believe in the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, they believe in all of it. They just have another book and you guys are going to discredit that and act like you're somehow, like that's the same thing where I'm like that religious narcissism where you're like, because I believe in it and it was before something, now that makes it smart. But if you believe in something different, that makes it stupid. And I'm like, to me, I'm like, you're all equally stupid. Sorry. But like, (laughs) you know, I... 
respect your right to be dumb. But like, that's just, you know, whatever. So, yeah. I will say that <laughs> I, through like my journey in life, through like my battles with alcoholism and all that kind of stuff and, you know, joining a 12-step program, whatever, I have like... I don't want to say higher power because mm. even that word like makes is weird for me, but I definitely believe in, I guess the law of attraction kind of yeah. what you put out into the universe is what you get back. Right. And I have to say that I do think about how religion might be a really nice or some kind of faith is probably mm -hmm. a really nice thing to have on some level, Yeah, you know, to go through life and to truly believe that you are destined right. to go to heaven and that when a loved one dies, that to really believe that they are like going into the comforting arms of God right. and they're going to be taken care of and yeah. they're happy now and they're watching you and they're waiting for you. Like that's a wonderful belief to go through life right. with. I think the difference for me is the idea that I don't need that idea to, mm -hmm. I don't need the fairy tale. You know what yeah. I mean? I don't need this idea of that. I see daily in my actions and things like that, that when I put good out there, I get good in return. And it's not an idea that I'm going to keep doing it just because I get something in return. It's just an idea where I'm like, this is how things should be. Mm -hmm. If you want to see change inside, see change in something, just be that change in it. And mm -hmm. then you can make that happen. So I'm like, to me, it, I don't need that. But I understand how like, I was watching some documentary before they're talking to some person about religion. They asked him like why they believe. They're like, well, because if you didn't believe, it would just be lawlessness. People be running the streets and, you know, assaulting each other and hurting each other and doing this. And I'm like, and it was like this kind of weird, like epiphany moment where I'm like, there are people out there that exist that religion is the only thing keeping you from becoming like a murderer. Mm -hmm. or like a psychopath. You're just like, oh, well, God said not to. And I'm like, that is an insane idea in my head to think that if if you were just left to your own devices, no rules were by society were put on you, that you would then choose to be evil in a certain way. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like yeah. you would choose to just hurt people because you're like, well, there's no consequences anymore. I'm like, I just don't understand how someone's brain gets to that point. Of believing that, you know, the needing something like religion to be yeah. the foundation of like, well, this is why I'm good. You know, Santa's watching you, so you better be a good kid. I'm like, just be good in general. Which, you don't by need the way, to, yeah. really works around Christmas time. Right. I fucking That's love true, yeah. Santa. I threaten yeah. my daughter with you Santa. Do the elf on the shelf thing. All the time. We haven't gotten there because she was too young to understand it last year. I think this year she'll Is understand that big it. Other stuff. But <laughs> they're always watching you. Look at him. He's sitting right there. Oh no, like, San Santa's like the best. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. do you want to? Do you want Santa to bring you toys? Right. Then you need to clean up your room. The yeah. speed at which she moves to clean up her room is yeah. unbelievable. Right. And it works good well with children. Absolutely. But as an adult, I'm like, you don't need that. You don't, you know, we put training <laughs> wheels on a bike to start, right? Yeah. But eventually you learn how to ride a bike. Yeah. So it's like, why are we still putting training yeah. wheels on this when you're 35? It's like, I was going to say, <laughs> like, shouldn't what makes you grow up to be a good person and want to do good in the world is, is your parents, right? Yeah. The upbringing that you have, you're taught from a yeah. young age that you should behave this way towards people right. because it makes them feel good, yeah. which makes you feel good and just creates harmony in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's where it right. comes from. Yeah. And if people are inherently evil, then I don't think religion is going to make any difference in that case no, at all. No, they're going to do whatever they want anyway. Right. Right. Because it always comes back to that narcissist part of it where it's like, if you think that what you do is right because you somehow are above everyone else and mm -hmm. know more than everyone else, then no matter what you do, you're always going to back it with this ideology that I'm right, therefore my actions are right. And right. you don't ever check yourself because you just, you believe in your ego so much that that's what takes over. Yeah. So, you know. As somebody who works in the adult industry, what do you think that does for like sex and people's view on sex? Oh, I mean, that hits, it hurts it detrimentally. Like I, I think that, that, and that's one thing I, I've, I've always been, interested in that might be um, a path for me um, after all of this and everything like that is somewhere in um, education and things like that. Just helping people understand, you know, or like therapy and being like, look, whatever you throw at me, like I've done it. Like, you know, we're, we're on the same page mm -hmm. because when you take away something as fundamentally human as sex, the feeling of sex or sexuality in general, it really takes away a part of a person, like a core part of a person, as much as you might believe different levels of sexual, I guess, intelligence are allowed and things like that. 
but it really just takes away from people their ability to just express a natural human emotion and taking that away creates something other than a human being, you know, because mm-hmm. that, that was coming from back when they all, you know, all the re- repressive eras of that were just coming from like, well, we're better than animals. We have these things to like repress ourselves and it really shouldn't be that way. You know, mm-hmm. if you're not hurting anyone, you should be able to act out whatever you would like to do sexually and be whoever you want to be sexually. It shouldn't be repressed or controlled by an ideology because in the end, if, if it's something sexual that you enjoy, then it's natural as long as it's not hurting or taking the autonomy away from someone else. So, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So when it comes to sex work, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, it's it's not for everyone. I'm like, do you like pistachio ice cream? Like, no, I hate it. And I'm like, I like it. Different. Like, that's fine. You want, you know, <laughs> you want to, you know, you like cheese. I don't really care for that anymore. Okay, cool. Like, it doesn't yeah. have to, we don't all have to be uniform. We don't have to like sex a certain way or participate in sex a certain way or participate in sex at all. Mm-hmm. But just because I like to do it this way and participate in a way that shows to many other people, you feel like you can tell me what to do. I'm like, that doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. So you don't believe that people should be able to go out and like protest against pistachio ice cream or follow them on Instagram I mean, and like write a lot of protest against comments. pistachio ice cream, go ahead, but you're missing <laughs> out because pistachio ice cream is delicious. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love how 15 minutes we like totally went off track but that's that's that's, fine. that's what I love about this podcast and talking to people like you so you grew up Mormon yes um and <laughs> that's where then we were. <laughs> that's where we yeah. were and then you got into the industry while you were living in Arizona yeah. how did that whole thing get started so I had um an ex of mine that did um camming uh, way back when one of the biggest um cam sites all girl cam sites um maybe had four pages up total. Like, Mm -hmm. so there was no one doing this back then. Mm -hmm. And she was killing it at it. And we had, you know, she was doing different shows and stuff. And we had made some videos of us and things like that. And we were selling them online. And um, as soon as I made some of those videos, other girls that were camming also in the Arizona area had seen me um, with her and asked about it. And I had worked with a couple of those other girls And they're like, hey, like you could maybe even do like, are you doing porn? And I was like, no, but, you know, um, I've thought about it. And um, I had a job where I was kind of writing my own schedule at the time. I found um, Nubiles out in Arizona and I Mm -hmm. saw a lot of girls talking about it. I didn't ever go the route of asking girls online how to get in the industry because that's never a good route to go to. You don't ever want to sit there and ask them that. They don't know you from anyone. It doesn't matter. Go find an agent or... In my case, I sent new bottles an application and obviously the applications were all geared towards women. But I was like, hey, I obviously I'm not trying to pretend to be anything. I just don't know how any of this works. How do I do this? And they were like, hey, we've been looking for like a guy in Arizona just in case we have people who leave shoes or don't make it out or I guess don't fly out or testing, you know, anything that could happen. And so they just hit me up and they're like, hey, like if you go and pay to get yourself tested, we'll give you a test shoot with another director who's trying to make his way into this and like another talent, a female talent who's trying to get into the industry. And so, um, yeah, you'll do a shoot. And if you do it, we'll just pay you back for the test. So I'm literally not making anything. I'm just making my money back. And back then paying 250 bucks to get tested was like a lot of money because my rent was like, it was like a quarter of my rent essentially. So I'm like, okay, I really need to like save to actually hit that mark. And then also, if I don't think I can do it, I shouldn't do it because I'm just going to waste all this money, you know? Yeah. So I kind of want to get a little bit more into like your actual application to New Wild Films because like you said, I get so many emails from guys who want to get into the industry and they're always like, how do I do this? Um, Like, what did it look like? Like, did you write a professional letter? Did you send photos? Like what, how... How did that go? I honestly don't remember all of it. I think they just had the standard, like, Model enter form. your name. Yeah. You know what I mean? What do you, you know, um, height, weight, breast size, you know, all that type of stuff. And then send pictures, essentially. For breast size? And so, right? 42B. You- <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, I, I put all, I, I just put that in. I sent the pictures of me, obviously, and was mm-hmm. just like, hey, you know, this is what, you know, where I'm at. Like, what can we do? And yeah, it ended up working out like that. So I think that's, yeah. uh, that's a good point, though, because I do get a lot of emails from guys and they don't send photos. Yeah. They're like, hey, I want to break into the industry. Like, right. this is my name. Like, this is, yeah. it. and then I'm like, 
photos, dude. This is right. a visual industry. Yeah, or like, a link to some sort of OnlyFans something, or something else. And yeah. obviously, too, it's like, dude, like not to be rude to you guys out there, but I'm like, you've seen what I look like. You've seen what a lot of the guys, the guys look at. You've seen what they're working with, too. If you don't fit that, man, try doing it on your own first. But the studios and stuff are probably not going to be looking for it. Yeah. Also, if you don't live in the continental U.S., why? Dude, like, you know, I like, know, I know. I, we know what states were, what countries we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we get a lot. Like, I get a lot of guys. I mean, look, to be honest, like, like I get a lot. I get a lot of guys from like the Middle East writing to India. me and from India. Yeah. And the, the thing is, is that even if like you're a very like capable right. possibility to get a working visa yeah. to come out here and shoot. Right. Is like damn near impossible. Yeah. So it's like, I don't yeah. know what to tell you because also I shooting porn list, there is illegal right i always just you list know what i list is i'm like here's the thing i'm like this is what you're gonna need you're one you're gonna need to get yourself to the united states you gotta get yourself to or LA, at least to which europe which is one of the most expensive cities to yeah. live in you're gonna have to put yourself up in some place which is probably gonna cost you at least two grand for the month then on top of that you're maybe gonna work two or three times and that's if you're lucky and you're gonna get paid next to nothing for that work because this is like it's a game where I've made a good foothold in this industry. If I'm not available, they'll start looking down that list. If you're still that new, you're not even going to get looked at, man. Like, it's that hard. Like, when you first start, you're making next to nothing with a rent that's just insane. And trying to, and then on top of that, you have to pay to get tested. So that's going to cost you easily another 400 bucks a month. Like, you better have a good amount of savings and time to be able to get out here. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. Like, and yeah. yeah. And I think you got to really yeah. think about it because so many guys, I think, think, oh, well, this is just this license for me to, like, fuck hot chicks for right. free. It's like, I always called it it's a kid not in the about candy that. store. Yeah. It's that that type of mentality yeah. right at the beginning where you're just a kid and the kid. You're like, I can fuck everybody and everybody wants to fuck me. And I'm like, that's not how this works, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's the quickest way to get yourself, like canned you know yeah. yeah and girls will do it too it doesn't even matter about the directors the girls will take care of that that quick you know yeah. <laughs> you start acting like that word girls around right away and then they're like okay we're just never gonna work with that guy yeah, yeah. the industry is small and it's over before it even starts so yeah. yeah all right guys stick around we're gonna take a quick commercial break and then we get back we're gonna talk a little bit more about cody's start and his advice for those of you who haven't been dissuaded yet um so we'll see you in just a minute Hello, my amazing listeners. You know how much I love bringing this podcast to your ears every week. So if you're looking a way to support the show and get some fantastic perks, I've got just the thing, my Patreon page. With plans starting at just $5 a month, you can be part of our exclusive community. Your support not only helps to keep this podcast going, but it also unlocks some really cool bonuses. Imagine getting access to the live streams of my interviews as they happen. You'll be right in the middle of the action, seeing all of the unedited moments. But that's not all. As a Patreon member, you'll also get exclusive bonus content. I'm talking extra mini episodes where our guests answer questions submitted by you. Plus, you'll have access to my fine art photography and behind the scenes videos, giving you a sneak peek into my creative process. And guess what? If you opt for a discounted year-long membership, you'll save even more while supporting the show. Longtime subscribers even get free HRU merchandise as a token of my gratitude. So want to join us? Head over to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered and become a part of our growing community. Your support means the world to me. Let's make this podcast even better. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. So just to wrap up um, the getting into porn and Cody's story, because I know I've still got a few guys hanging on, hoping for that insight that's going to that's gonna get them there. Because the thing is, is like sometimes I feel bad when guys write to me and say, I want to get into the porn industry. And I almost always ignore every single fucking email. And sometimes I do think to myself, like, Every guy that I work with now who's like a solid performer right. that I book a lot that was I like that guy at one was point. that guy at one yeah. point. So you basically got in because you were dating somebody who was camming. You started doing videos with her. So like you had a little bit of experience mm -hmm. um, and then you had that work to show other people. Yeah. And so that kind of was your foothold. Do you think that that's really what helped you get in? No, honestly, because uh, like doing it at home, like you're filming only can only fans at home or the stuff we were filming back then, nothing even close to what we're doing on set, like yeah. not even close, like not even same ballpark, you know, yeah. that was just, I guess, the very first rung of experiencing whether or not you can get hard with even a camera watching you, mm -hmm. not even a human being, but just a camera watching you. 
I think really what it is, is my ability to learn. I'm a very quick learner. So if you show me something, I'm going to be able to repeat it pretty quickly and learn it for myself. And that's one of the things that I've always said as far as um, male talent are concerned. I think some of the best male talent, um, you're almost part of the crew because mm-hmm. your your idea, they, they're they setting up lights, they're setting up cameras, all in these angles to make the girl look her best. And then you're the on scene, like, gaffer almost in a way like you're moving the girl in these positions and yeah you're moving her in a position that obviously hopefully feels good to you but also posing her body in a way that underneath those lights and those cameras looks good for the cameras it's not about you as much as you might like to think that it is it's more about making her look the best she's going to look and then obviously having sex with her in a way that the company wants you to so yeah it yeah, seems like so learning. little of it is actually about your pleasure. Yeah, not really. No, a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously there, you know, there's, you know, any day doing that is typically better than most other days, but at the same time, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not about you. So, yeah. yeah. What do you do when you get on set and you're like not vibing with the girl or she doesn't seem like she's interested in the scene? How do you handle situations like that? Take a blue chew. Right. And use code Holly, get your first one for free. Uh, um, just pay five dollars in shipping. Bluechew.com slash Holly. Yeah, there you go. Go on. <laughs> right. Uh, it's almost like it's habit. Um, <laughs> I mean, as a guy, I think our brains work differently. You know, mm-hmm. um, typically I can kind of find something about that person that I would be into. If it really gets to that level when I was first starting, I'm at that point, I'm just that's work, man. That's a performance. You know, mm-hmm. you got to perform to a level to be like, all right, I'm going to pretend like I like this person. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to pretend right now that yeah. this is someone I actually want to have sex with right. and then push through it. So, you know, you have to just try and, I guess, kind of fake it to a certain extent. I mean, nowadays, if it was really down to that point, I would just not do it. I mm-hmm. have the reputation to be like, I'm just leaving this alone, walking away from it. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm not doing that anymore. But you know, back in the day, yeah, it's still one of those things. And I think that's something, um, cause I was talking to, I texted you about it from a yeah. Demi's, uh, episode two, where I, w- I wanted to hit on the fact that, you know, um, there are a lot of girls who come in that maybe do this for the wrong reasons or disassociate during, or don't really want to do it. And I think one of the days, cause this is like another thing on there too, when I, when I felt like I was really in the industry, like I was really like a respected performer. I looked over at the director um, and I knew that this girl was not into it. We both could tell. And she just took a second to like leave the room to go to the bathroom real quick and come back. And I looked at him, I just went and he was like, like, and just gave me that notice of like, I know it's not you. I know it's her. Just get this scene over with and we'll all go home. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? That type of thing where before as a male talent, I was like, if I don't make this look good, like if I don't push this, if I don't get this to a point where this looks like something decent, they're going to be like, why would we hire you again? Because that girl obviously wasn't into it. You weren't doing your job well enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, I think that what gets discounted a lot in that is the male experience of that, of going to a set and having to be the one that, gets hard and goes inside of someone knowing the whole time that they don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a big empath. I feel that type of thing. And if you put me in that position, I mean, now I'm so thankful to be at a point where I will just walk away because I'm like, I I don't want, I don't want the repercussions. I don't want the rest of my day to be shit because in my brain, I'm just going to be thinking about that. Like it really, it affects me mentally and sexually as well, too, where I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't really want to tell you what your autonomy is, but I'm going to do what I can do, which is to leave the situation because I clearly understand that you don't want this to happen. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it has been a very long time since I've had something like that come up. But at the same time, that's a really detrimental experience to the male on the other side of that. And I know that the women, I'm not trying to victim blame anyone or say that anyone's feelings were invalid because you might be going through something or you might have had traumatic experiences and things like that in the past, but I don't know those things. You know, I'm not, I'm not your therapist. I'm not in that room with you. And this industry is obviously a place where you're going to be doing adult actions in an adult way on an adult set with another adult. So when you come to set like that, when you bring those things with you, 
a lot of times it just gets spoken in this light where it's like, oh, it just, it was me and I was in this place and it affected me, but you're discounting the effect that it has on the male performer as well. Like I know not every guy is going to have those same emotions or not everyone, every guy is going to feel it that same way. But to me, it really, it really like hurts me and almost makes me like emotional talking about it just because like, it, it just sucks to be that person on the other side of that, the receiving end of that. And to really look at someone and understand that they don't want to be doing this. Something yeah. as intimate as having sex where something that's something that's super intimate and very much a part of my life that I really love. And to watch someone take that thing that you love and just make it into this like experience that I'm feeling with them where I'm like, this is horrible for you. You don't even want to do this. Like you don't want to be here. I'm like, it just makes me feel gross and it makes me feel like I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And so one of those things where I said where I'm like, you know, I, I don't want anyone to feel like you need to be in love with the person that you're working with every single time, or you need to be all over me the whole time. I'm like, no, but like, if you're going through something, if you need that time, if you need some space, or you're you're trying to figure something else about it, this is not the place to figure that out. Like, don't put that on someone else. Don't involve someone else in your stuff. Because you don't know, that guy could just be like completely ignorant of your feelings and just who cares and then make it even worse. Mm-hmm. Or it could be someone like me where now the rest of my day, I'm like, I almost want to cancel the next couple of days to really just take a minute to center myself because I'm like, I don't want to. It affects you that much. Feel, oh yeah. Like it, it will affect like my whole drive, my, my mood for that too. Yeah. I'm just like, cause it just, I, I can tell, I, I understand. And I'm like, I feel sorry for them. Yeah. But I just don't, you know, I'm like, this is not the place for you to be figuring that out. Like me being inside of you is not the moment for you to figure out that porn is not for you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's a lot to put on somebody. Yeah. And it just doesn't get talked about because the way they treat men in this industry, especially, is that you're just a robot, you know, just Mm -hmm. get it up go and do the job and it should be great because it feels good for you all the time. Why would you ever have a care in the world? It's the greatest job ever. And it can be, but there are other days where, you know, those types of things can really affect someone and change their view on this type of things. And some, some guys I've seen take it the other way where they're just like, they get off on the idea of a girl not wanting to be there because they like the idea. It's an egotistical thing of like, she wouldn't be doing this if, if if she wasn't getting paid, which makes it kind of hot, you know? And I'm like, it's just, yeah, so that, that can be a breeding ground for that type of environment. But I think that that male experience on that end really does um, affect some people and especially affects me. But luckily, I feel like I've gotten to a point in the industry where now I can just say no and be like, look, like you might want that and you might want to keep trying it. But like you need to to figure yourself out first and I'm not going to be a part of that. So, yeah, yeah. no, that totally yeah. makes sense. I hear you. I've definitely been in a situation where I was directing a scene and like the girl didn't want to be there. And yeah. I remember actually having arguments with agents and I'm so glad that it's, the culture is different now, especially like after COVID and with mm-hmm. the rise of OnlyFans and everybody yeah. being so much more independent and not afraid to yeah. be blacklisted by canceling right. or saying, I don't want yeah. to do this or whatever. But I definitely have been put in a position where the girl didn't want to do the scene. And I like yeah. called the agent and I'm like, she yeah. like she can't you know yeah. either like she's in pain from the day before right she's not in a good mental state she needs to go home right and like they're just like and then they call the girl and like yell at her and like she's crying right. and i'm like oh great now i'm gonna shoot a fucking yeah. scene like are you serious and then the yeah. clients don't care because they paid for it and right. if i cancel the day um you know yeah. then it's on me right i yeah. have to cover all the costs because right. like she wasn't in a place mentally where she could right. do the scene. And that's not fair to me. It's not fair to her. Right. It's not fair to really anybody. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the company should, and now like, I'm so grateful. I mean, I'm not shooting right now, but you know, working with mind geek or Alu, mm-hmm. like, especially now I have this stance of like, if she's not okay, yeah. kill the day. Yeah. We will pay people's kill fees. Like right. we understand we don't want them in that position. Yeah. Um, and everyone's not good for it. anybody and it's yeah. not worth the money. Right. And, and everyone can do it. I mean, even like uh, Owen Gray, I think is one of the best yeah. examples I ever have with him on set is he literally tells you when you're coming there, he's like, hey, if this, something changes during the scene, if you get 90% of the way through and you're like, I just can't do this. I need this to stop. I need to go home. He'll still write you a check and send you on your way. Like you're all set. And it really just comes from someone who actually cares. Like he's not 
a huge company. He's not making ad scenes and pulling in all this money and just rolling in it enough to be like, oh, I can just throw things away and who cares? But it's because he was a performer and he understands that and respects that idea that, you know, some people will push themselves further because they're, they need that paycheck. Like they mm -hmm. need that money for something in this city that costs way more than it should ever cost for anybody. Mm -hmm. But like they need that. And that's the main factor. And there are some people who could have had a really crappy day or really crappy week and just put it aside and be like, I'm still here and I'm a part of this. And there are some people who just can't do that. And I think it's one of the things that needs to be taken care of more often is really being like, you know, hey, like we, we can really lose this day. Like we could lose this if we need to. Like it's not going to break something if we just for mental health reasons be like, hey, look, this day is just not going to work out the way we want it to work out, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where some of the girls I know they're worried about being a bother on set or being this or being that. And it's like, you know, you really got to take care of yourself, though, first and foremost. You know, that's what needs to happen. So, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, what is your favorite kind of scenes to do? Do you prefer gonzo or features, big productions, at home amateur? You know, I like to be challenged. It's hard to say because there's parts of it that I like about all like features I like because I love I like doing the movies and really portraying a character and doing something that's kind of different and also doing something that I know is part of a, a bigger scope of something really making an idea of who a person is come to life in that type of thing. And um, I think one of the reasons I've gotten cast a lot for features as well, too, is because I'll carry that character into the sex scene. Mm -hmm. I don't just stop at Which the kissing. Which I think is so important. You know? So many yeah. people drop that character right. once they get into the sex. And they do one thing and then it yeah. just comes out the same. And I think that's one of the things, too, that I've harped on before as far as like just a performer in general. But I believe for male performers... And female performance is a different female performance. Your versatility comes from the types of scenes you do. You can you could do anal, you could do this, you could do that. You know what I mean? You can do all those types of things. And I think for male performers, it comes from the other end of knowing that if you're supposed to be kind of a more timid character in this movie and you're really supposed to be kind of pushed by the girl or something like that, that you really keep that character through it because it doesn't make sense when like I was doing teen roles and stuff where I'm supposed to be like a virgin and I'm like, Oh my God, like I've never seen boobs before. And then two minutes later, I'm like choke fucking her yeah, yeah. and like slapping her and stuff like that. I'm like, it doesn't make sense because yeah. this character is not that person. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of that dog comes from ego and things like that. And I think it was one thing uh, Seth had also said on here as well, where, you know, a couple, you know, a good decade ago or even a little less, it was always about that gonzo. Like you could do the other scenes, sure, cool, whatever. But when it comes to the awards, to the attention, to the nominations, to the actual things that people consider in this industry to be what matters, is it always came down to the gonzo type of scenes. You know, as rough as you can be, as hard as you can be, doing these crazy positions and stuff like that. And I really think that someone's overall performance of course, includes Gonzo because Gonzo is a part of the industry, but it also includes the the tenderness or the nuances to sex that can go into a sex scene to really bring and keep a character throughout something rather than just being like, hi, honey, I'm home from the office. Time for me to like, you know, gag you or something and like choke you until like you like that's not what you wanted for that mm -hmm. scene. You know, I have a question. So you mentioned the awards mm -hmm. um, because I've heard so many girls tell me that you know, in order to win that coveted award, like, you know, performer of the year or whatnot, they need to do a gangbang or they need to do a DP or they need to do anal or they mm -hmm. need to do whatever, all of these things. Do right. you ever feel like trying to achieve those awards pushes girls to do acts that they may not be comfortable with because they want that award so badly? For sure. Yeah, I, I think that people... I think what it is, is it's a hard line to draw. It's a very gray area kind of thing because at work, right? Maybe you have a corporate job and maybe you stay five extra hours at night, one night, or you stay three extra hours, or you go out of your way to buy your boss coffee, or you go out of your way to do another project or to train someone else. Those are all acts that you'd be like, okay, you're perfectly fine with. You're doing something you maybe didn't want to do in order to show that Bring you can, that extra yeah, mile. right. You're going that extra mile. You're a team player or what have you. And the thing with the industry is that that extra work is sex. So 
it really comes down to is, is this girl putting herself in harm's way? Are you having, you know, like a lot of girls were like the eating disorders. Are you really uh, ready to do this? Is this something that you want to do and you know where this will take your career? And maybe you're not so comfortable with it, but you're ready to do it. Or do you feel like the only way to get yourself noticed, the only way to get all this is to really just do something that you don't have the ability to do. And I think that always just comes down to the person, you know, yeah. if you, if you're in a place where you're like, I might not like anal, but I know if I do anal, I might win an award and you're fine with, you know, exchanging guess, the two. I guess if it's like, yeah, it's whether or not, is it a challenge or is it you compromising your boundaries? Right. And that's right. why that gray area and, is hard because, yeah. because it is, you know, to me, it's the same as if you're like, I'm going to do an anal scene. Maybe your boss is like, I want you to take this transfer to another state and be away from your family for two weeks or three weeks to train people, right? Mm -hmm. You know that that might get you something else. You might be, you know, brought up in the ranks quicker because you did something like that and proved it. But you also have to sacrifice time being away from your family. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be in a new place. Okay, so maybe you, you know, you're like, well, I could do the anal scene and I know the anal scene is with this person and for this company and a part of a big feature and it'll probably get nominated and get all these awards, but it's going to be a really uncomfortable day for me. Like you got to kind of weigh those two and figure out to yourself, is it worth doing it or are you compromising something that you are just not uncom uncomfortable doing all for the idea that you have one shot at getting something, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, what, what are the awards that matter? Because you're right, like performer of the year right. is performer of the year. Right. It means you can perform and you can do right. all this crazy sex stuff that most people can't right. do. That's why you're a porn star. That's why right. you and get the awards. And then there's like best actress award, which is like right. a totally different thing. Yeah. You know, like And that's, you could spend your whole year never doing anal, just acting and get yeah. best actress, you know. Yeah. And like Vanna, you know, when she won last year, it was it was because of the showcase, because of what she did in the showcase. But in the showcase, she did her first anal. She did her first DP. Like, you know, I'm like, so there was all of that that hit all of the Vixen media groups, like marketing, the all the different sites that they had as well. So there's a little part of all those different things. But also she did those first. Now, it wasn't her first time, obviously, you know, getting fucked in the butt. Like, we've done that enough times it and wasn't. stuff like that, too. Right? What? Sorry, guys. Not first all of her. First on camera. So, <sighs> yeah. But, um... <laughs> You know, it's just one of those things where she she was like, I'm ready to do this. She was prepared to do this. She wanted to do something big and to go hard for it. And that's what she decided on doing. So that wasn't even something that I would consider. I mean, obviously, it was challenging, but it was never a compromise of anything like that. She knew that that's where she wanted her career to be before. Like when she switched over, I think the big turning point for her was switching over from ATMLA and then had this plan set up covid set that plan back and then with vixen she came up with it so it was all a methodically thought out thing so i don't think there's any compromising of that but there are certain girls especially with certain agents who try and push things because that agent knows they're going to get paid more money mm -hmm. that girl you know could do this for a couple of months and then quit she could be a lifer and then just be like mm -hmm. i love this let's go but it's that compromise in that moment of going, am I really ready for this? Or am I just telling myself I'm ready for this because yeah. I think that I'm going to win an award? Yeah. And that comes with like knowing right. yourself, which exactly. is a longer journey for some of us than for others. Sure. Yeah. 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 So it's, you know, yeah, it, it definitely, that's where that gray area comes in. It's really a personal decision, you know, yeah. and, and people will consider it be like, oh, well, it's because it's sex. And I'm like, it's, it's not any different than doing a lot of other things. It mm -hmm. just happens to be that it's a, an orifice in your body, maybe, that that's what's being, you know, taken away from you rather than family time or something else, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. So when Vanna was, you know, preparing for her showcase, mm -hmm. did you, like, preparing to do anal or TP, <laughs> did you, did she practice with you? Like, did you help prepare yeah. her for that? Yeah. Now, how did that feel? Because so often there's, you know, a lot of my listeners can't imagine sharing their girl with mm -hmm. other men, especially on camera. Yeah. So the idea of helping your girl prepare to have sex with other men is like mm -hmm. so foreign to people. Like, yeah. how was that for you? I mean, obviously because it's something that she actually enjoys it as well too. Um, that was still a fun part to see the enjoyment on her. Now the idea of, you know, the scene that she was going to do being for the movie that it was and the people that they cast for it, I was kind of annoyed that I wasn't involved in that. But mm -hmm. also I didn't want it to be a thing where it's like, well, of course it went well because it was her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I don't ever want to take that away from 
of her or something like that to make it seem like, you know, just because we're both performers that like you have to pick me over everything. But it's still, you know, it stings a little bit to be like, you know, you're going to have this big showcase going down and I don't have any part to do with it. Mm -hmm. But um, but obviously, you know, what I wanted was what was best for her. And so when Vixen was doing that, I was like, hey, if they're picking these people, they know what they're doing. So they obviously have done it before. Yeah. Um, as far as the other parts of it, like preparing her to have sex with someone else, I'm like, I don't know how you prepare a girl to have sex with Jason Love. Like, <laughs> bro, like, dude's the nicest dude, but I'm like, damn. He is so like, nice. Yeah, I was like, Such whoa, nice like, okay, like, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, you know, she had been fooling around with that before and she was always kind of into, into the uh, butt stuff as well, too. So mm -hmm. it was more about just um, the dilator kits and mm -hmm. working all that up, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever face any kind of jealousy situation in your relationship? And how important is communication? Huh. Um, I don't think we've really ever faced any sort of jealousy on that end, but it's also because she's super picky about people. Um, and I've also been someone who, whenever it comes down to like another guy or someone that she might be into, like, I'm always consider of the fact that I have 10 years on her. Um, I have a lot more experience dating as an adult and experiencing other people and things like that. So uh, we always talk through some of those things. And there's been one other person that she was kind of like seeing for a little bit. And it was just an idea of like, hey, like, you know, you need to make sure that you're we're checking in together the most, like the communication between me and you. I'm like, there's been other girls that I've fooled around with on the side or people that I've kind of kept that were like almost getting to the point of like, oh, maybe this could open up into like a, a dating type of thing. And it's always come down to the fact that I'm like, you know, whenever I'm talking about taking time with this girl or someone else like that or doing something else, I'm checking in with her first, making sure that there's nothing that like she could need me there for, nothing that would take precedent over what I'm doing on the side. So communication is always the the most, you know, thing like that, where I've even told her before, too, I'm like, there's been certain girls, I'm like, this girl, when we go to this place, or when we see her she's going to act a little bit more towards me. She might be a little bit more emotionally invested. And I'm like, I have, I've made it very clear to her that I'm not as emotionally invested in her and made it that way, but I can't help the fact of how she feels about something. And just letting her know that she was like, that's a really like insightful thing ahead of time to tell me, because then if I see her that way, I'm never wondering what your thoughts are on. It. I know what your thoughts are on, it, unless you're just absolutely lying to me. But I'm like, I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not lying. You know, yeah. that's why I wanted to make it very, you know, across to her. And I've even had girls who are like, well, they're worried about, you know, shooting content with me or fooling around at all. And like, if you want to, you could FaceTime her right now and she'll just tell you over the phone. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Because we have that type of relationship where I built that um, for myself, at least through just experience. She's like, he's never given me a reason to lie or things that he's broken it off with certain girls when it got to a point where either they did something that we didn't, we both as a couple felt like just crossed a line. And I think that's one of the the better things too, is, you know, certain guys will try and, um, they try and negotiate, you know what I mean? And I'm like, that's not, I'm not negotiating anything with this girl. I'm like, this is the most important person to me. You have to understand and realize that. And then if we, if it fits, it fits. If it starts to not fit, I don't want to lead you down a road that's going to put you in a compromising place because now you're hoping on something that we've not talked about or we haven't discussed or it's not going to go that way. And just making sure that's very clear. So, yeah, yeah communication is obviously the most important so thing. So you guys would say that you are polyamorous, like you do sort of date other people? It's very rare, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If if it came down to that too, and if there was something like that on the, you know, that was out there, then then we could discuss that at the time. But most of the time it comes down to, um, you know, we've had a couple of different groups of like girlfriends and stuff in the industry and they just always refer to me as the communal boyfriend. You know, <laughs> I'm just passed around between other stuff like that too. But also it kind of, it takes a little bit of that off of that of making it, not making it, I guess, what people would consider like weird, you know, mm -hmm. like it's also part of our work, but it's a fun thing that we do. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I enjoy pleasing different people and mm -hmm. stuff like that too. But there's there comes a different limit between when it really becomes something that's like, oh, I could actually see myself dating this person. And I've always been upfront and told her ahead of time, like, oh, I'm actually kind of feeling a certain way for this girl. And like, I'm not, you know, not even acknowledging it with her yet. We're not going down that road. I'm just telling you how I'm feeling ahead of time and making sure that it's never a surprise to her or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite thing about Vanna? There's so many things. Um... <laughs> You know, the one thing I like about her is her um, her strength, I think. Just her as a person. Like, when she really decides to, like, do something, she 
puts her all into it, but also her, I guess her strength or I guess it, toughness in a certain way where like she doesn't, she doesn't just take shit. You know what I mean? Like she dishes it back and I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. Like I never have to, I don't want to ever have to have a partner that I'm constantly like worried about mm -hmm. or trying to protect. Yeah. I mean, I'm very protective over her for sure, but just knowing that she could handle her own, you yeah. know what I mean? Like knowing that this girl's not just going to be like, you know, some guy tries to say something or act a certain way or some girl acts a certain way that she's going to just be like, oh, I guess, you know, I just didn't really know what to say. I'm like, no, she just knows how to dish it right back. Yeah. And so I'm like, I don't have to worry about you, you know, taking care of yourself. I don't have to be that guy that steps in, in the way of you, you know, or something. If you want to get into it with someone, like, go for it. Like, I'm there to back you up. But like, you're that person that's going to like lead that because she really is that tough and strong of a person. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know yeah. she definitely comes And seeing her way. dedication coming up to the showcase over the summer was hugely like the turn on for me, just seeing the dedication that she put forward to it and being yeah. like, this is a goal that she wanted to achieve and she knew what she needed to do for it. She planned ahead of time. She executed the whole way through. And, you know, haters have seen it and been like, oh, it was this or it was that. And I'm like, no, it was just all hard work. Like that yeah. girl is, is tough as nails. So she's not taking shit from anybody. And like she deserves what she's got because she earned that shit. So, yeah. yeah. I love that. I want to talk to you about the image of being a guy in porn. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the expectations for maintaining a certain physique are similar for men and for women? Or do you think it's stronger one way or the other? A couple of years ago, I would have said it's probably a lot more on the girls. I think now where we're at, obviously there is, you know, you're still marketing an image. Your body is still a product. So that is always going to be there. But I think recently we started to evolve and have a better idea of like including more body types of people, including more, you know, different hair colors, piercings, tattoos, like things that you would never have seen in like 2005, you know. You wanted that bleach blonde, big fake boobs, nothing on your body, just no tattoos. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, you know, we have girls who, you know, they might put them in the alt category, but there are so many girls that fit the standard category that still have ink or still have piercings or still have something. Mm -hmm. And also the body types too. You don't always have to be, you know, tiny as a rail anymore. For guys, I think it's always been, there are certain companies that obviously the look you know, needs to be that type. You need that muscular guy. And it looks better on camera, obviously, if you don't have a gut blocking a lot of those things, yeah. you know. I mean, like, just that, logistically. You know. Yeah. Yeah, blocking the me, penetration. I need, I need every inch I can get. So I'm just sucking <laughs> that back in. Just like, all right, does it look longer now? I'm like, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I think now it is opened up a little bit more. But obviously, as performers, you're always going to put that on yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it doesn't even come from the industry. It just comes from, you know, examples in society. I think even outwardly, you know, as much as those girls, you know, your social media feeds might be filled with other girls who are, you know, snatched up or body work or editing their pictures. It works the same for guys. My feed is just constantly just dudes that are like, you know, they only eat chicken and rice all day and they just do roids and look yoked out and like go to the gym and also edit their photos too. And it's just like, it's this world where now you're just constantly bombarded by it. And there's no way like, you know, and I always try to remind myself too. I'm like, if I ever wake up just like looking at myself, I'm like, I look like garbage. I'm like, there's also that guy that I'm comparing myself to. He's looking at himself in the mirror going like, I look like garbage yeah. too. You know what I mean? So it's like, we're all doing this to ourselves. We're all looking at these images. We're all seeing the same things. And it really just comes from reminding yourself, like, do I feel good? Do I like what I am? Because if you don't like something about yourself, feel free to change it. Like, go ahead and change it. But don't let other people or the idea that like social media has put on to you, make you do something to change yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's but, but yeah, back to the question. I think, I think it, it's, you know, it's obviously still more towards the girls. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously when you look at the guys that are in the industry, even as they get a little bit older, maybe kind of lose their body a lot, they're still looking better than a lot of average guys. You know, they're mm -hmm. still above average for sure. So yeah. It is one of those things where it's, you know, it's like, do you, you know, do you do, do you start doing like Roy's? Do you start doing replacement human growth hormone? Do you start doing all these things to make yourself look a certain way? 
And it's like, when I really get there, I'm like, is it really going to change, you know, who you are, how yeah. you perform? Is it really going to change that? Or is it just something that you just need to get past mentally for yourself? You know? Yeah. Also, like, I have to say, I keep forgetting because, you know, I was born and raised in LA, mm -hmm. which you're constantly surrounded by right. beautiful, skinny yeah. people, actors, you know, all the models yeah. and actors and actresses come here. Yeah. And then like, I'll leave LA and I'll go to some other city in some other state or yeah. something. And I'll be like, whoa. Okay, I right. People yeah. do not actually look yeah. like they do in this city. Yeah. Like I was and I'm a, like, okay, I'm I'm not that I'm all right. Like yeah. it's weird. I forget about that. I was in like Texas actually picking something up for the kinky parties that we mm -hmm. do. And um and I was like, I just I was in this store in like a Target and I just asked this woman, I was like, Hey, like, um, is there a place around here where I could get like paint, like a paint store or something like that? And she looks at me and she's like, Oh yeah, you ain't from around here. And I was like, <laughs> What do you mean? She's like, You got that California look. And I was like, just one of those things where I'm like, they can even pick it out on the other end too, where yeah. you're like, there's a certain it's you know, it's a certain look, you know, yeah. in the most vulgar way, I guess, of saying it. It's like, you know, you could be like a uh, an Ohio full of, you know, seven, but you're an LA four, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. that LA look where it's like, once you get to one of these cities where it's just people that look a certain way or yeah. take care of this or modify themselves to look a certain yeah. way are all around you, then you just get used to it all the time. And then you go to another state and not to say that everyone in that state is ugly, but it's just one of those things where you're not used to this environment where not everybody is all, everybody here has a goal of being in front of a camera or being yes. noticed in some yeah. sort of way. And so when you're trying to get noticed, you're going to look a certain way and right. maintain that look to keep that up. But then, yeah, you go somewhere else and you're like, whoa, okay, this is what everyone looks like. Like normally healthy, yeah. it's perfectly fine. It's just, yeah. you know. These are yeah. not people who are like yeah, living their lives world. to like look great on camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're not getting naked all the time and having everyone see every part of you yeah. regardless of clothes. So, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the kinky rabbit parties. Yeah. Can you explain to us what those are and what your part is in them? The way I would describe it is a very, it's a very upscale themed party that sex is um, allowed or sex positive in that certain way. So the parties all have different themes. It always comes down to the actual um, just production of creating this environment that shows that type of theme and continues it throughout the party. And then at a certain point during the party, there's a performance and after the performance has ended, that is kind of the cue to all of the guests uh, to then now it's time to have fun. And what, so, what is the performance? Is it generally like a burlesque show or is it the performance is a like a live sex show? Oh, yeah, it's like a live sex performance. Okay. Um, and so that's what kind of makes that job harder in particular because you have to be in that moment ready to go. Mm -hmm. There's no let me go down on you for 10 minutes or let's make out for a minute or, or like, let me take some time to do this. Tell me five minutes before we're going to shoot right. the scene because I'm going to go like pop a Viagra or like right. shoot up my dick with camera jack. I mean, you can, you can because they do give you a good amount of notice <laughs> yeah. beforehand, but it's still like, you know, if you're having a bad day on that set, they just turn the cameras off. And wait for you to get there. You're not, that's not happening here. Yeah. It's got to go and be there. And if it's yeah. not, it's not. So, um, Yeah. Do you think the parties would be as successful as they are without like dedicated performers? Because, you know, they have like some pretty high end performers that yeah. perform there. No, um, I, the parties, you know, I mean, as far as the 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 look and the theme and everything like that go for the parties, that all comes from the creative director, um, Alina. Alina's amazing at, at putting the, the mind, her vision that she has for each of these things is just. Yeah. She's imagining the craziest like type of party environment that you would think of just, you know, all the way down to every detail, the things that we build and put together there, the way like I have a video, I can show it to you after on my phone, but just I took a video of the room when we had finished it and then the room when we had reset it back to the house. And it's like night, you would never know that that existed there in that place, but it's their vision of creating and putting that together. And then the performers, as far as that sex performance show goes, the performers are so integral to that. Like you have to have people who know their bodies well enough to know how to perform for a crowd, know how to like open up. So obviously having a skill of being on a porn set, mm -hmm. it's a very condensed and short, it's maybe 10, 15 minutes as the as all the show is in, in its entirety. But knowing how to really make those minutes work is hugely important to that you know because mm -hmm. those those parties i mean people will walk away from it and they they love everything else too but that that performance that they have they're always just like that was amazing you know and then yeah. so after the performance is done and everyone gets to play mm -hmm. 
do the guests get to play with the performers or the guests play with each other or like? So mostly the guests play with each other. The problem okay. is, is that um, for us, at least performers and things like that, they're all using condoms and things. Right. For us, you know, you you can, I guess, if you wanted to. For me, I really just abstain and just uh, I'll play with other performers. Um, if there were people there that were brought in from the industry, it might be like, okay, like, you know, we've been doing this certain role all night. We're ready to go. Like, let's go put on a show in this bedroom. And for us, it's just enjoying and having fun together. But to the guests, they're like, oh, like, this is kind of being like, oh, wow, like, we're let's like watch or let's like jump in, you know, type of thing with it. So, um. But yeah, everyone there is is very pleasant as far as consent is always mandatory. Everyone is always kind of in the moment of even asking, like, oh, can I touch you? Can I do this? Can you do this? Is it okay if, you know, what do you like? What are your, yeah, as a couple, like, what do you, you okay with, you know? And so it really just creates this really positive environment. Yeah, a lot of the guests, they, they're really just playing with each other. The performers, a lot of times, will be asked or invited to, and... I've seen some, like, you know, I'm like, I've spanked some people before, different things like that, but nothing where it's like fluid yeah. exchange because I'm going to be going to work, you know, two days from then. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. just not worth it to me to do that type of thing. So yeah. I've kind of wanted to one time and just been like, cancel work for a week and just like do it, you know, just yeah. to do it the real way and have some fun. But yeah. Do the guests generally bring like, like a somebody else that they want to play with? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, a lot of it, and that's what I think the thing is so unique about this group is it's really created this kind of community mm-hmm. where um, groups of people will come together and they really kind of just play amongst themselves. So it's kind um, of like a swingers community. I would say it's more like just people who they just all like the exhibitionist deal of doing that type of thing. It's like just having fun with good friends, and then an environment like this just amplifies it. You know, yeah. you could do this at your house, sure, but is your house going to have lights and a DJ and performances and a theme and drinks and, you know, having a good time, you know, it's not always the same. So it really just provides this community environment. People are really just enjoying the night, having fun with each other. And honestly, a lot of times, you know, an hour or two into it, a couple of our rooms will just have run out of gas and people are just kind of hanging out and just having like talking and like a cuddle puddle. Like that's been one of the the most popular rooms that we always set up now is we just set up a giant cuddle puddle and people will watch. Um, we have um, a good friend of mine, Marcus, and he likes to tie and do suspensions and things like that. And he'll have a lineup of girls just waiting to get tied. And you'll have a room full of people just cuddling in a pile watching girls get tied and spanked mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And it's just all around just a time where everyone is so interested in what's going on. There's always something to look at. There's always something going on. And it's just a very positive environment with people too, where, you know, I don't think I've ever had situations of someone trying to do something they shouldn't have been or trying to push something with someone. Everyone is just perfectly polite and cordial to each other. And they're all just of that same mind where we're, they're all like, well, let's have a, a good night. Let's have a great night and mm-hmm. fool around and have fun and watch each other. You know, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I just mm-hmm. I'm going to ask it because I know a lot of people are thinking this. How does one like get invited to these parties? It feels like yeah. it's not something that you can just buy tickets to. It feels like a very exclusive invite only kind of thing. Is that what it is? It's it's not necessarily. So you can go to kinkyrabbit.com um, and you can follow them on social media. You can look them up. They'll have um, the pink rabbit as the logo. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost, yeah. I follow them just because I love rabbit. like, yeah. I love their... The their, aesthetic their for it photos, too. Yeah. their aesthetic. Yeah, the videos yeah, love, on there so are beautiful. amazing of each part of it. Like yeah. you go and look at, you'll take a trip down like Alice's like little wonderland type of yeah. thing, you know, just fall into the rabbit hole and just watch all of this, you know, craziness unfold. But uh, yeah, you can go to the website, you can apply there. Um, you apply through there. And once you're accepted and once you become like your, your application has been approved, you're then a member on that site. And then at that point, it is just as easy as buying a ticket. Okay. Um, there are different levels of tickets. There are tickets just to come for the night. Um, you enjoy the bar, you know, have a good time out there. And then obviously, you know, you're free to, to play or whatever. There are packages where you can have a bottle and a table to yourself, things like that. So there are things like that that go on there. But really, it's, you know, it's, it's through the application process and then getting approved. And once you're approved, then you're all set. You can just you can come and go as you please when you buy a ticket. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I have it's a really it's fun probably, night. It's probably not cheap. It would be my guess. I mean, you know, we're we're hosting these parties, and when you yeah. see when you see the videos and see everything that goes into that, like she she designs all the costumes herself, the design, yeah. the the aesthetic of the rooms, the things we put in there, like that is all us 
putting together an experience for people. So a lot of work and time goes into this. So, you know, you yeah. pay for it. But when you pay for it, you know, you during you the party, for. there's no cell phones mm -hmm. um, allowed. The cell phones are all checked in up front and everything like that. So everyone is just living in that moment. There's no time to stop and take pictures or do this. So the videos, you know, I talked to her before about where I'm like, we need some way to show people what goes on here without doing it in the moment, you know, because yeah. we want to protect everyone's privacy and things yeah, like that. We don't yeah. need to be blasting everyone's face all over the internet. But we also want some way to show people what you've done and what she's created. And so those videos really show, you know, the creativity, the level of the performance, the level of the the costume and the design, everything like that. Yeah, once you get to see it, then you'll know what you're paying for. And when you go there, like, trust me, it is it is one of the most unique experiences in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. All right. Well, Cody, thank you so much for coming in. I still had all those get those questions that you sent me <laughs> that we never got one to. Or two of them? Okay. Let's do one of them because I still have Patreon questions too. Oh, that's true. So I still have a whole separate segment to do with you with Patreon right. questions. You pick right, one yeah. of these stories of to tell me. Um, Cody's just like been texting me right. randomly yeah, over true. the last couple of weeks, like stories. Because well, I'm trying to, to think of something. There's so me. many things sometimes I just forget. Um, we could just do how Van and I met. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh we talked. One? Well, we talked about the shit in the bucket. Listen, if you want to hear about the bucket go shitting, the other one. just go back yeah. into my YouTube history. Um, go search yeah. for Cody Steele AVN yeah. interview and you can hear it then. We don't need to repeat yeah. it because we just, we just have yeah, too many yeah. other stories. Yeah. Yeah. Van and I met on a, it was a boy, girl, girl, girl with two girl extras. Mm -hmm. Um, One of those like, BFF sites, all the girls, you know, together type of thing. And when I came into that day, I kind of was just sitting alone to myself because when you have that many girls and they're all new at the time, they were all new. They're all probably from the same agency. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to let them do their girl talk type of thing, have a good time, whatever. So they're all over there doing that. And then at one point she just comes over and comes up to me and she starts talking to me and like sits there. And I think she even actually started going down on me before the scene even started. So like we kind of had, you know, we had that like chemistry like, Hi, right nice there. nice to meet you. I'm Vanna. Can I suck your dick? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, she had told me after that she had seen me online before and she had a little bit of a crush to start with. So that's kind of cute. Um, <laughs> and then um, it was one of those scenes where, you know, they're trying to test out girls, you know, to see who takes the lead, to see mm -hmm. who takes charge, you know, who does that. And it was just kind of dumb. It was a scene where this director was like, it was a, it was supposed to be a bachelorette party and I, they hired me as the DJ, right? And so they're supposed to be going crazy at this party. And then eventually one of the girls was like, I dare you to like kiss him or like, you know, mm -hmm. do this or that. And it just, it looks so bad because the house that he got was like, has these giant vaulted ceilings with these windows up top and the windows have no covering on them. Oh no, so it's so clearly it's during like the day. So it's two in the afternoon, sun just blaring into this like rave, right? That we've created. <laughs> lights are still going, but you can barely see these like colored lights because it's so bright inside oh, the house. Someone didn't like scout then, the location like, obviously first. Obviously <laughs> we can't pay for music. So we have like a two minute, 15 second track that just repeats fucking <laughs> over and over. And I'm like sitting there like doing the whole fucking thing and like this. And it's just the same track over and over and over again. But um, yeah, we did we did the scene. And obviously, you know, at that point, I'm like, you know, when it comes down to me, I'm like, I'm looking for the girl who wants to fuck. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if it's all three of you, awesome. We're going to have a good day. If it's two of you, cool. If it's one of you, okay, we're still working with it. And she was the one who really was like throwing it back, was like ready to ready to go, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I don't think any of those other girls are in the industry anymore, but it's just one of those things like you can kind of tell from day one where you're like, if you're getting after it, you're getting after it, you're going to get that call back, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, we did the scene. Then after everyone else was like, oh, like we're going to go outside and like, you know, smoke. And we're like, oh, okay, cool. And we like pretended to walk with them. And I like looked at her, I'm like, you want to go fuck in the kitchen? She was like, uh-huh. And so like we just <laughs> went and we just fucked again in the kitchen. Yeah, after that. And then, um, yeah, once I had uh, kind of broken up with my ex, we, um, we had this whole story where like um, uh, there were two other performers. They were moving into a new place in Burbank. They had a back house. And I was like, hey, like I met this girl the other day. She really wants to get out of her agency house, the model house. She seems like she's got a really good head on her shoulders, really normal type of girl. And they talked to her and met her and they were like, all right, cool. So she took the back house. And then what ended up happening is a couple months later, I broke up with my ex and they were like, hey, we need help with our rent. Do you want to just move into the other bedroom in the main house? So they ended up being the two of them in one room. I was in the other room and then Vanna was in the back house. 
And the other couple that we were there with, they were very open as well in their relationship too. So we would kind of just all hang out in the house. We just smoke, have a good time, and we'd end up fooling around and stuff a lot. And so from there, we kind of had this exposure and relationship. And I told her that I wanted to take a while before I actually started dating someone because I don't want to do the thing where you just look for the things that your partner wasn't giving you and jump Mm -hmm. into someone else without really realizing who you're in with. You know, I'm a very intentional person. And so I told her, I was like, you know, I want to take some time. And we hung out for a while. We did um, we did a trip to Columbia, which also was on the, the thing as well, too. Um, and when we did that, everyone was kind of treating us like a couple. You know, we were staying together on this trip and stuff like that. And, you know, I was like, okay. And then I was like, that's this is pretty much, I'm like, I like this girl a lot. And I think it's been enough time that I really can make a clear, level-headed decision to be like, this is someone I want to go out with. And then... I think a month or so after we got back, I asked her out for like in for like to be like really to be like, okay, let's actually be in a relationship now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that. And how long have you guys been together now? It's coming up on five years next month. Wow. So yeah. Amazing. It's forever in porn years. Yeah. 70 years. I know. (laughs) I know. Right. Are you guys planning anything for your anniversary? We got a little spot in Malibu just to Mm -hmm. staycation kind of, you know, we have a lot of, it's already filling up, you know, it's always August to after AVN is always insane for us. Last year, I think we hit, I think it was like eight different countries, nine different states. We were home yeah. for maybe like three or four weeks out of those whole like seven months, I think. Yeah. So yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. So, and this year is not as packed, I don't think, but it's kind of, you know, it always ends up being one thing after the other, after the other. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, I love that. Well, I love Vanna and I love yep. you. And so I'm so happy that you guys uh, Thank you. found each other. Yeah. I think that's really sweet. It can work. It can work. It can. It's very, very rare, but it can work. <laughs> yes, you are a great yeah. testament to the mm-hmm. ability to date in the industry yeah. and have a good relationship. I mean, she got she got you a reverse gangbang for your birthday. I still can't get over that, <laughs> right. that story. Yeah. If you guys want to hear that story, yeah. it's on my red carpet interviews from the Expiz. Yep. <laughs> um, I think it was the Expiz nominations. So. so many copycats after that. <laughs> <laughs> like the, Every guy's like, um, I would like what Cody had. <laughs> yeah. I'll take one of what he's having, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you tell everyone where they can find you online, please? You can find me on uh, Instagram at Cody Steele. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Cody Triple X Steele because Triple X is my middle name. <laughs> so dumb. But I always say that because it's just stupid. That's what I thought when I did it. So um, that's it. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, OnlyFans and stuff, I think, is Cody Triple X Steele and then just Cody Steele free for the free page where you have. You can buy any of the stuff I've always made. And then the other one's a VIP page for if you really are interested in the content, you just get one low price and it just keeps coming every month. So, Yay. Yeah. And it's an E at the end of steel, right? Yeah, C-O-D-E-Y-S-T-E-E-L-E. Okay. I like vowels a lot. I yeah, guess. I can see that. Yeah, right. There's and, a whole story for that name. It's yeah, another time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a few more stories that we're going to get out of Cody, but you can only get those on my Patreon page. Um, I have some questions from Patreon members, which I'm going to ask him in a separate segment. Um, but in the meantime, you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on X. And of course, like I just mentioned, join my Patreon for access to interviews like this live, bonus content, Q&A like we're about to do, my fine art photography, all kinds of other stuff. Patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you next week.